Welcome in here on DIVII's breakdown of 12 series to watch this upcoming weekend in Division II baseball. Robert Fry is here. I'm Will Connerly. We are glad to bring you some big matchups that we're going to break down this weekend. Just as we had last week, we each came up and picked together 12 total series uh, that we plan to break down here today. And then there's a handful of other series to watch. We primarily focused on series that either involve nationally ranked teams or had big implications within their conference. There are a few that perhaps you would have maybe thought or suggested we should cover. And uh, some of those maybe aren't on here because they're already happening. As we post this on a Friday, we're focusing on those weekend series. Now, at the end, we'll kind of detail some of the ones that we didn't get to that either started with the weather across the country early this on the midweek series, which are still critical battles, or there's some of those just conferences that we still plan to highlight throughout the year, but just have a two game set. And some of those are big and we'll get to those later on. But Robert, without further ado, we'd love to welcome you onto the program and let us know the first series that you're looking forward uh, to getting into and breaking down as we, we start off and go back and forth with these series to watch. Hey, well, I'm equally excited. You know, who needs March Madness when you got D2 baseball? That's what I'm here for. D2 baseball is the best, and it's across all sports. We'd rather watch D2 baseball here, and we're going to provide you the content so that you can keep watching some amazing D2 baseball. I'm fired up. So our first conference series is a series that actually got pushed back all the way to Sunday, Monday. So a doubleheader Sunday, one game Monday, and that's sixth-ranked North Greenville, according to our poll, and 12th-ranked Barton according to our poll. So Greenville at 21-6, Barton at 23-5. and five. It'll be at Nixon Field in Wilson, North Carolina. Barton is 20-1. and one. Yes, 20-1 and one at home there. So that's going to be a tough matchup for North Greenville. I know they just came off a series loss on the road to UNC Pembroke. Now they got to play another great team at, who plays well at home, and that's Barton. And so, like I said, it's a Sunday doubleheader starting at noon Eastern and then a single game on Monday at 1 Eastern. The Conference Carolinas Digital Network is where you can watch it, and we're excited for it. For So let's talk a little bit about Barton. Barton, they have the eighth best batting average in Division Two at 339. And, well, you know, we could talk a little bit about that, too. You know, John McNamee, he has the po- – he's just leading the offense in all four of the quadruple slash line categories. 421 batting average. 558 OBP, 614 slugging. He's got a 1,172 OPS. And, you know, other guys like Chase Waddell, Salvatore Lamo, they have a 378 and 362 batting average, respectively. Gavin Gilmore, he's a freshman. He has an 11-game hitting streak, and he's second on the team behind Mac me with a 392 batting average. So, really impressive stuff. But most impressively, Will, is Tanner Halverson, who might be a two-way player of the year candidate, as he's 6-0 and on the mound. He leads the country in strikeouts with 62. He also leads his team with 28 runs driven in, and he's hitting above 300 as well. So a lot going on there for that Barton offense, and especially on the staff. Like, he's a part of that staff that's 13th in the country in ERA with a 373 figure, 10th in whip at 129, and they're 23rd in the country in strikeout rate. So Tanner Halverson is just one of many that's going to perform well for this Barton team, hopefully for Barton's sake, but on the flip side, North Greenville, they do have a lot of force, forcible bats. You know, we have Pat Monte that's hitting over 300, but David Lewis, of course, he's hitting 432 with an OPS nearly at 1,500, best in the Conference Carolinas in both of those figures. He also has an astounding 24 extra base hits in 40, of his 41 hits, 24 have gone for extra bases. He leads the conference in RBI with 42 as well. And so a little bit there, but can this Barton offense that's performed so well perform against two very good stars? Now, Jake Monroe is usually their game one guy. He sports a 2-1 ERA. He's third in the conference on that mark. And Reese Fields, although he struggled last week, 
a lot of his metrics still suggest he's going to do very well. He has a 2.79 ERA, a .86 WHIP, and a 1.79 or a 1.79 batting average again. So there's some suggestion he'd be bouncing back, but again, this is a great Barton offense, and it'll be exciting to see because again, they're playing at home and they're 20 and one at home. So that is the first series I want to highlight for this series to watch. Yeah, that's a huge one in Conference Carolinas, a nationally ranked battle. Really looking forward to that one. See if Greenville can bounce back or if Barton can continue to stay just unbelievable when they play at home. Now we go to the Lone Star Conference. The next series that I'd like to touch on is Lubbock Christian, a team receiving votes in our D2BI and DIVII Top 25 poll. And they play Angelo State, the reigning champs, who are ranked 17th. Uh, These two teams are toward the top of the Lone Star Conference right now. The series is going to be in San Angelo, Texas at Foster Field a Friday Saturday, Sunday, four games set. You can watch it on the Lone Star Conference digital network if you have a subscription. And for the Rams, uh, they took three of four last week in a high-scoring series against St. Mary's. Jacob Guerrero, he led the way. He's having a great season, had 11 RBIs last week and was the reigning Lone Star Conference in South Central region hitter of the week and the Rams, they're a team that, well, they played Lubbock Christian six times in 2023 and won every time they swept the regular season in both of the postseason games where the Rams were able to clinch uh, their third straight Lone Star Conference title. But Lubbock, a team that's second right now, just behind West Texas A&M in the Lone Star Conference standings, two games ahead of Angelo who sits in third. So number two versus number three in the standings right now. And the Chaps, they've won nine of their last 10 matchups. That lone loss came in a split when they stepped outside of conference play against Regis last week. And their team that's really just swung the bat really at a high level this year, hitting 345. They've got 23 triples and 38 home runs. All of those marks lead the conference. Carson Oglive, he sits third in the conference with an OPS above 1,200. Now, where this will get interesting is going up against an offense with guys like Trip Clark and, as mentioned, Guerrero. The pitching staff for Lubbock Christian is not great. Bottom half of the league with a 6.66 ERA. So how they can limit an Angelo offense, especially on the road, is going to be something to watch in this series. Trip Clark, a guy with the bat for the Rams that leads the conference in batting average, hits, RBI, second and runs scored. He also has four triples on the year. And then Guerrero, he leads the conference in OPS. He's second in doubles. That's just a tandem and a lot to deal with for an opposing staff when you got to face those two guys in a lineup. Treadway also, Tayton Treadway's got 15 doubles toward the tops in D2. And Weston Valisak, he's a guy who's been hit 19 times, so finding a way to get on base. And then on the hill for the Rams, it's Dax Daffy, who leads the nation with 53 strikeouts, primarily coming out of the bullpen in long relief appearances for this Angelo State team, who usually will start Elisa Gutierrez in game one. He's the only guy for them that's really been a consistent starter. Five and two and seven starts for him. And then John Stacy, a guy who you might see start, but it's going to be more of a Dax Dathy out of the pen and more of an opener role for the other games that they have. But It's going to be a fun series. Obviously, Lubbock's really hot inside Lone Star Conference play, and Angelo's won three consecutive series. So a team receiving votes traveling to the reigning champs and a nationally ranked team. It'll definitely be a battle to watch, and with the two and three teams in the league, big implications within the Lone Star Conference this weekend. You got it, Will. And, yeah, there's there's a lot of big implications, and, you know, credit to the Angelo State pitching staff to kind of be a little bit dynamic this year, you know, switching from your typical starter role to now like an opener, as you mentioned, you know, and Dax Daffy's been big on that 53 strikeouts, which is amongst the top in the country. 
with with that many strikeouts. But Will, I want to go to another Lone Star Conference series, and this time instead of two versus three, it's number one versus number four, and we're going to talk about a UT Tyler team going to Canyon, Texas at Wilder Park and playing a ranked West Texas A&M team. UT Tyler 17 and 11 overall and in conference. They have yet to play a non-conference game. West Texas A&M is 19 and 7 and 18 and 6 in the Lone Star. They have yet to lose a Lone Star Conference series. As they've only split, either taken three or four or split or swept a conference series so far this season. So it's a four game set. You got a Friday game at 6:30, a Saturday doubleheader at 4 and 7 and then a Sunday at 1 o'clock there. So a lot excited there with a subscription. You can watch on the Lone Star Conference digital network, but we'll talk a little bit about both of these conferences and squads. So UT Tyler, you know, they, they have a duo of weapons at the plate. Lane Hutchinson, he's hitting 369 with 12 doubles and he had a walk-off hit last weekend. Ethan Bedgood is hitting 361 with the team leading 39 hits. Both players are tied for the team lead with 24 RBI, you know, and a player to look out for on the mound is Garrett Artadondo, who has been ro- inserted in rotation the last couple of weeks. He has a 2-5-1 ERA on the season, and, well, someone had to replace him in the back end of the bullpen. He had two saves before being inserted in the rotation. But don't fret, though, Will. Colby Parker and Nick Neighbor, Parker with a 1-3-5 ERA and a 1-1-3 whip, and Neighbor a 2-8-9 ERA and a 1-1 or a 1-2-3 whip, have covered the back end of that bullpen in their combined 32 innings. So can they stop a team that's top 20 in the country, specifically 18th in West Texas A&M, hitting 331? And that remains the same, but they're predicated on getting those hits. Like I mentioned, 18th in the country at 331. They have four guys at or above 385. Ryan Camacho's leading the way at 404. Corey Schmidt leads the team with seven home runs at 385. And Dylan Fesperman leads the team with 28 RBIs and is hitting 400. Kyle Miklas leads the team in doubles, and he's hitting 389. And, you know, speaking of bullpen, as we mentioned earlier with UT Tyler, West XAM has a great pitcher out of the bullpen, and Reese Miller, as he has 26 strikeouts over 20 innings. Miller also has a .9 ERA and a 1.05 whip there in the Lone Star. So a very interesting series to see in terms of, you know, can a team like uh, UT Tyler go into West Texas A&M and take a series, or can West, S- West Texas A&M continue its dominance and lead in the Lone Star Conference? Yeah, two really big Lone Star Conference series. Uh, really looking forward to both of those matchups because obviously there's implications um, for teams in the top four, kind of like we saw in the MIAA last week with each of the top four teams playing against each other, there's just a lot of implications that happen uh, when that ends up happening. So definitely something to know. You'll get your money's worth if you have a Lone Star Conference digital network subscription for sure upcoming this weekend. And as we progress, we're going to talk about an MIAA series, as we just talked about that conference and how we highlighted some series last week. How about let's highlight another series that I'm really looking forward to, Robert, here this week. And I know you are as well. Central Oklahoma, who we have ranked 11th right now in the country. They're 22-5 and five overall, and they're 9-4 and four in MIAA play, going up against another MIAA team that is nine and four as well within conference play. They're receiving votes. This will be, of course, on the MIAA network, a pay per view subscription, just like the Lone Star is. But for UCO, man, they've won seven in a row coming off um, uh, what you saw for. The Gorillas, they're coming off a series loss against Missouri Southern, dropping two of three. But on the other hand, UCO, they're hot seven in a row. But every game was close in that series for Pittsburgh State. And last season, Pitt State took two of three against UCO in the MIAA tournament first round last year. And and so these two teams are in a three-way tie for third place in the MIAA standings. Uh, It's the Gorillas, UCO, and then Washburn, who are tied right now. 
The Gorillas dropped a non-conference road decision to Oklahoma Baptist on Tuesday. And Pitt State's a team that's hitting 314, 8.5 runs per game. They've really just hit it at a high level. They rank second in fielding percentage in the MIAA and ERA, and then they're third best in average. And it's Dylan Karashi Choi Fu who leads the team hitting 369. Senior catcher Nixon Brandon's hitting 348 with seven homers. And then Kay Clemens hitting 309. Tanner Leslie, four and one on the mound. And for UCO, it's Carson Carpenter leading the way, hitting 356, OPS above 1200. Eight bombs, eight doubles for him. He is great um, over this last few weeks. He's 11 hits in his last 12 games, multi-hits in three of his last four on a five-game hit streak. So Caleb Birchfield, Dax Sharp, Brady Gilmore, those were the starters last week for UCO, and they'll try to continue success in what is going to be a pivotal MIAA series. Yeah, very pivotal in that MIAA series. You know, <clears throat> again, talking about when we got talk about not just MIAA but the central region like a lot of these teams are vying for postseason spots outside of just the MIAA conference but in the central regional tournament and series like these for both teams can really prove that hey we belong in that tournament so you know let let us in uh allow us to be a part of that into the CCAA where we're going to talk a, a little bit about two offenses that are hitting the ball really well and really recently as it's number one versus number two cal state monterey bay at 17 and 7 13 and 3 in the ccaa with cal state san marcos 13 and 8 12 and 4 in the ccaa second cal state monterey bay is looking really well they've won 10 of their last 11 it's going to be at san marcos at the csu sm baseball field we have a friday and saturday double header friday starting at 11 a.m pacific time and then Saturday starting at noon Pacific time. But let's talk about this. That CSUMB has not lost a CCAA series so far this season. And, well, they're fourth in the country in hitting at 349. They're 15th in on-base percentage and ninth in slugging and OPS. 15th with the 442 OBP and a 542 slugging. And, man, you want to talk about offense. They have a ton of offense. They have six players at 340 or above. KC Coalici at 415. Cole Merchton, 392. JJ Ingman, 390. Brady Miguel, 367. Nico Hartojo, who had a great week last week, 350. Chase Lindemann, 340. And as a matter of fact, those first four guys I mentioned, Coalici, Merchton, Ingman, and Miguel, are all slugging above 550, so really impressive there. Ingman, Miguel are above 650, and Coalici is above 750 slugging. So, like I said, they, they can really spray the ball across the yard with those extra base hits, why they're a top-10 team in the country in slugging. And on the mound for the Otters of Cal State Monterey Bay, we'll see this weekend is Ryan Platero. He's 4-0 with a 426 ERA in 25 and a third innings. However, he'll have a lot of play on this weekend as the team that is second in the conference in batting average slugging percentage in OBP is Cal State San Marcos, 315, 426, and 510 in those three categories. And, you know, we'll see how they face against the, the team that's number one in the conference with a 452 ERA in Monterey Bay, but they do have quite a bit of offense there too. Phoenix Same, Luke Reese, Garrett Tenusin. Cameron Mahaffey, Ethan Rivera, they're all above 345. That is a tough, tough lineup to go through. And not only that, but all five of them have an OPS over 1,000. So not typically what you see in the CCAA with a lot of, you know, it's it has that stigma of a good pitching conference, but these two teams are getting it done offensively, and that's why it's a series to watch for us. It really is. I'm really looking forward to that one. It's going to be fun to see what happens. Obviously, there's been a lot of intrigue within that league this season, as there is with every conference that we break down on a weekly basis when we look at everything within uh, the Division II baseball landscape. So, yeah, that that is going to be a really big series to watch. Another one that I'm looking at is going to be West Florida, a team we have ranked ninth in the country right now as we head to the Gulf South Conference at Delta State. And uh, Delta State, a team right now, when you look at the Statesman 15, 
they're they're a team that's seven and five right now within Gulf South Conference play, and they're a team that's been able to win fifty ball games thus far and a few games above five hundred. While West Florida seventeen and eight and ten and two in Gulf South Conference action. West Florida eliminated Delta State from the conference tournament a season ago. That was an eight seed versus one seed matchup at the time. Delta won a midweek against Trevecca six to five. They ride a two game win streak into this series, but they're coming off the heels of a series loss against West Alabama. That was a really tightly contested series. Number nine, West Florida. They really took care of business last week, sweeping Christian brothers, but Lost two midweeks against nationally ranked Georgia Southwestern, so they may bring a little gusto with them on the road as they try to get another Gulf South series sweep in a row. West Florida currently leads the standings. Delta State is sixth, but there are seven teams within this league in the eight to 10 win range. So a lot of teams wanting to breathe down the neck of West Florida, so to speak, but they're clearly a front at 10 and two ahead of everybody by far in the loss column and the win column. So that certainly helps their case. But again, seven teams in that eight to 10 win range within conference wins and Delta state being one of those teams. That's something to watch. Tara McDowell has been something to watch as well. Leads the team with nine bombs hitting four eleven on the season. He has really done a great job with a strong OPS of one, two, eight, five, and Dalton Newshander, Jacob Heath, and Cade Mandershai. That's a pretty good starting rotation. It's why we think so highly of the Argos. Those were the guys who were ran out there last weekend uh, for West Florida. Mandershai, he's now 5-0 and after throwing a complete game last weekend while just allowing one earned. Since Heath has been inserted into the rotation, he's provided great length for them and then also of course, we know how good New Shanner is. Opponents just hitting about 200 off him on the season. They're second in the league in an ERA at 457, but in conference play, whereas we mentioned they're 10 and 2, they have a sub four ERA as a team through 12 conference games and are hitting 355 as a team in those conference games. And McDowell, he's been the most impressive within league play. 21 of 42 with six bombs and a 1,500 OPS in Gulf South action. Dylan Coleman, he leads the Statesman with seven bombs, six doubles, hitting 385 and an OPS above 1,000. Logan Eldridge, arm to watch. The record might not mean that. He's one in three with but a 1-2-4 ERA through 29 innings and five starts for him. Win eight innings last week. Didn't allow an earned run. But he got the loss in that outing, shows that he has the ability, but the Statesman will look to give him run support at the home this weekend, and that's why we give this one a series to watch. Absolutely, Will, and like you said, will Delta State take vengeance on ending their season by the hands of West Florida, you know, hosting them at home this weekend? Big Gulf South series action there. We're excited for it, but we're also excited as we transition now to the MIAA, and that's, we're going to talk about two teams that were on here last week, and, well, they're going to remain on here, and that's between Washburn and number four ranked now, Missouri Southern, as they both won their midweek games, Washburn over Southeastern Oklahoma State, Missouri Southern over Drury, and, well, this is a team with a lot of offense, and like you mentioned, so Missouri Southern tied for first in the... MIAA at 11 and 2, they're 24 and 5. Washburn at 15 and 10, 9 and 4 in the MIAA, as you mentioned previously with that Central Oklahoma Pittsburgh State series. But that's going to be at Warren Turner Field. It's a one game Friday, one game Saturday, one game Sunday, six o'clock Friday, and then one o'clock both on Saturday and Sunday. And well, Again, this is another thing of more offense. Washburn, they're top 25 in the country in batting average, 21st to be specific at 328, fourth in slugging at 599, and fifth at OPS at 1018. But for Missouri Southern, they are 13th in slugging at 534 and 14th in OPS, just under 970. So really excited here. Both teams are top five in the country in home runs as well so a lot of offense but speaking of offense the Washburn offense does have a lot of say like I mentioned 
those metrics, but it's led by Peyton McCark, who's three home runs last week and now puts him at number one in the country with 13 home runs. And he's also second in the MIAA in RBI with 37. Cash J, he also had a big home run in powering their one defeat, or I should say one victory of Central Missouri as they lost two or three, but won that last game thanks to a big three-run home run from Cash J. He has 10. Mick Harg, Jay, and Connor Scott are in the top 10 in the conference and hitting as each of them are all above 385 for this Washburn offense. So a high-powered offense at a hitter-friendly park. But on the flip side, Missouri Southern, they have some arms. But first, we've got to talk about that offense. Their, their leader of play is Henry Kuziak. He's break, broken just about every record you can think of there at Missouri Southern. But he's hitting 421, 555, slugging 804. He has an OPS of nearly 1,400. All four of those metrics are top five in the conference. He's also tied first for the conference with his teammate, Will Doherty. And their first one and two in runs as well. Ethan Clark, another guy we should mention, he's hit safely in 14 of his last 15. Cole Gaiman, when we transition now to pitching, he is uh, a force to be reckoned with on the mound. He's the league leader in ERA at 151. He is 6-0, and which leads the league in wins. Batting average against 144 and second in strikeouts. So can he continue off his 7-2 and two third, one run, 10 strikeout performance last weekend against another high-powered offense in Pittsburgh State, like you mentioned earlier, Will? Also, another guy to talk about on the mound is Cale McAllister. He went eight strong last weekend. He carries a three ERA. That's fifth in the MIAA, but he's also second in batting average against behind his teammate Cole Gaiman at a buck 72. So... Very excited to see how that conference action in the MIAA will play out for both of those teams. Oh, yeah. A lot to look at every week. I mean, back-to-back weeks, we're highlighting multiple MIAA series, and and for good reason. It's a conference that at the top, um, all of those teams look like they could go really far. And so that's going to be fun to see. Uh, who's ultimately going to be the top dog? Of course, a couple of the top five teams in that league. Um, as we continue to at least stay on the theme of with that same region, Robert, let's go to the GAC. Southern Arkansas ranked 15th in the country, travels to Oklahoma Baptist, who's 16-11 and 11 on the season and one game below 500 in conference play. Meanwhile, Southern Arkansas atop the league at 12-3 and 19-7. and, 19 and 7. Overall, we have them ranked 15th, and after SAU lost a GAC series a couple of weeks back, they took two or three from Southern Nazarene last weekend with a couple of dominant 10-plus run victories. Southern Arkansas leads the league in the standings, as mentioned, while Oklahoma Baptist, they're tied for eighth, just one game below 500, but this feels like a weekend they could get back on track hosting the league's best team. And this is a big battle. It's a battle between the two schools that played in the Great American Conference Tournament Championship a season ago. OBU is 11-3 and three at home. We should note that. And they will try to hit better this week. That was one thing that kind of fell short for them last week. Just hit 239 as a team at Monticello a week ago. And SAU, it's a tough team to hit against. They have a 402 ERA as a squad. That's 20th best in the country. The Bison are led by Isaiah Lassade, a name we've talked about quite a bit this year. And why not? He's 10th in D2 in total bases, seven bombs, 32 runs scored. Alex Schroeder as well, nine home runs, the active leader in Division II in bombs. And he is always a force to be reckoned with as well. For that side, the OBU all-time leader in home runs. He's 10 away. Could he get that this weekend from the RBI record? Their OBU rotation, it's Burke Galbraith, Noah Fiesel, and Cameron Poole. We'll see how they can fare against SAU, who's got a really strong rotation with Michael Howe, Tim Rafino. They each have a pair of complete games. They can go the distance. And that's not to mention Jeremy Adorno, a guy who you can say the words All-American next to his name. And he has 53 strikeouts on the year. Will Richardson's leading the way, hitting 381. Brandon Nicole has eight bombs and has scored 31 runs. And the starting staff, For SAU, they will have a challenge on the road against an OBU offense, no doubt about it. But for Howell, Rafino, and Adorno a week ago, they went 19 innings combined. 
for those three on their starts and just allow one earned run. So it's a staff that's throwing the ball well and a team we obviously think very highly of. They've been within our top 10 here this season and currently ranked 15th right now. And as they try to stay atop the GAC, it's why we have this, a rematch of last year's Great American Conference Championship as a series to watch here this week. And yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Will. Like, Southern Arkansas struggle, has struggled a little bit the last last few weeks, but can they get back on track? And can Oklahoma Baptist continue its run? As their week has been a busy one. They beat Pitt State in a midweek contest. So that competition does not get any easier this weekend. But thankfully for Oklahoma Baptist, they have been at home. So they have a slight advantage there being the home squad. So speaking of home squad and speaking of teams that are in – terms of just dominant right now we're going to go to a non-conference series and we're going to talk about nova southeastern against valdosta state nova southeastern has won seven in a row valdosta state's currently 14 and 11 eight and seven in the gulf south their seventh valda or excuse me nova southeastern 15 and nine six and third six and three in the sunshine state tied for third in the conference and well it's going to be a three-game series friday here Today at 6 p.m. Eastern, and Saturday it's a doubleheader at 1 p.m. Eastern for as well. And, well, you can watch it with a Flow Baseball subscription to be able to watch those games. Otherwise, you can follow along on the live stats for the Valdosta State Blazers as well. But, uh, like I mentioned, Nova, hottest teams right now, they're winning 7-0. They haven't. Just an interesting dynamic matchup here. You know, Nova's 412 OBP is second in the conference in the Sunshine State. And, well, Valdez is a team that likes to pound the strike zone. They don't really strike out a lot of guys much. They're more a pitch-to-contact type of team. So be very interesting to see, you know, how many walks are really thrown there between Nova and Valdosta. But the dynamic duo of Brian Lariga and Justin Walks are a tough number one, number two in the lineup. Both players in the top five in conference and hitting at 405 and 397, respectively. Lariga has hit safely in eight of his last nine. Walks, however, has hit safely in 12 of his last 14 games. And speaking on the pitching side, they're 17th in the country. And, well, we got to talk about Edwin Alicia. I know he's only had eight innings pitched, but he struck out almost 50% of the batters that he's faced in those eight innings. So that freshman lefty is going to be a force out of that bullpen for Nova Southeastern. Can they continue the seven-game win streak on the road? Colin Rothermel and Alex Valentin, starters for Nova Southeastern, they didn't allow runs. didn't allow a run in their starts last weekend, but this will be a tough test against a team that's top 25 in both batting average and on base percentage. And speaking of that batting average and on base percentage, we'll talk a little bit about Valdosta here. As, like I mentioned, they're top 25, they're 24th with a 327 batting average and 21st with a 435 on base percentage. And well, they may, it's a menace for them to deal with for opposing pitching staffs. Dennis Pierce leads the team in hitting at 393. Jacob Harper second at 388, and he's hit safely in 10 of his last 12. Giovanni Kangita is up to 369 after hitting safely in 11 straight. Both Pierce and Harper are top 10 in the conference in hitting. Pierce is amongst the national leader in RBI at 38. And while that list doesn't include Ryan Romano, who's hitting 455 in 18 games, but we'll see if he returns to action. He missed last weekend, so we'll see if he does return this past weekend. But one interesting note that I found, Will, in terms of starting and relieving for Valdosta is, well, there's a big difference between starters ERA and reliever ERA for this Valdosta State team. So here's the facts for you, Will. Valdosta has a 791 ERA in 79 and two-thirds innings for their starters. However, a 348 ERA in 116 and one-third innings for their relievers. So can this starting rotation, which has been mixed and matched quite frequently this season as nine different players have started at least one game for this Valdosta State team, can that starting pitching be successful to help that bullpen? And if so, it could be a series win for Valdosta State. So 
that's one of the series that we would like to highlight. Yeah, that's definitely going to be a something to find. That's a great poll right there as well, Robert. Um, if you can get some length, you feel confident about what you can do um, out there in the back end. Speaking of confidence, as we go to the Peach Belt, while well, North Georgia was a team that was really riding with quite a bit of confidence as we uh, was were putting together our latest top 25 rankings. They cracked it, ranked 23rd, and they're a team that is playing Lander this weekend. They're 17 and nine and five and four in Peach Belt play. North Georgia is 19 and six, and they're eight and one. A hot start. For them in conference play scheduled right now as uh, Saturday Sunday series not exactly sure yet on the times it was originally a fry sat sun but looks like it's going to be moved but nonetheless we're going to see three games set here in Peach Bell Conference play North Georgia though they had their nine game win streak which as we mentioned brought them into our rankings come to a halt with a pair of midweek losses against some good teams, receiving votes Lee and number 21 Catawba before traveling to Lander this weekend. So take it a couple on the chin, and now they step back into conference play. Lander, they were impressive last weekend. They took a series at Columbus State. They've won back-to-back Peach Belt series, while North Georgia leads the conference standings. Lander's in a four-way tie for fourth place right now, and they have a chance to gain some ground on the pack here this weekend going up against North Georgia. They're tied for the lead in the conference. Both of these two teams in fielding percentage should see some good clean baseball here this weekend. UNG leads the conference as they've smoked 66 doubles on the season. And when we look at Lander, Connor Drozzi is hitting 325 with a 1,300 OPS, which is second best in the Peach Belt Conference for Lander. He's second in the league with 11 home runs. Ethan Wilders hitting 365 with an OPS north of 1,000. That's eighth best in the Peach Belt for Lander as well. Bennett Nance and Ethan Califf as well. They threw the ball well last weekend against Columbus State. Can they keep this up against a North Georgia team that's been a tough beat in Peach Belt play. Tyler Overholt is also a guy to watch out out of the back end. 1-0, four saves with a 1-8-0 ERA. For North Georgia, well, it's Noah Darden, a guy hitting 423 on the year. That's the second best average in the league. And then Wes Lott, a guy who's just done a lot of good on the mound this year. Six wins. He's 6-0 and with a 3.95 ERA. That's time for most in the Peach Bell on the win column for him. And then the starters of Dylan Nose, Daniel Courtney, and Wes Lott, I mean, they have been excellent. When you talk about good starting pitching, kind of on another leaf, which you talked about on the other side of it, they're 13-0 and combined, the starters are, this season for North Georgia, a team that's won a lot of ball games, 19-6, and headed into the weekend, and they haven't lost a game with their starters of at least those three who are combined 13-0. and And they all have ERAs sub-3.95. They've thrown the ball really well, and they'll look for good starting pitching against a good-hitting Lander team who's won a couple of Peach Belt series in a row. So it should be a fun matchup, and again, another series to highlight. Absolutely. Well, it's an amazing series to highlight. And one guy I'd additionally like to highlight for North Georgia is Andrew Sopata, the oh, yeah. leadoff hitter, who is currently the leader in the country in multi-hit games with 15 Unreal. multi-hit games, which is absolutely amazing on that end. But speaking of absolutely amazing, we got to talk a little bit about the performance of a number eight St. Leo team who is 21 and three. And 7-2 and two in Sunshine State and play. They're going to take on Embry-Riddle, who Embry-Riddle is only one of two teams to beat Tampa so far this season. So Embry-Riddle at 14-8, and 3-3 three and three in Sunshine State play. They are tied for fifth. St. Leo's, again, mentioned them. They are 22-3 with that midweek win over West Georgia and 7-2 and two in Sunshine State play. So excited to see that. As I mentioned, again, 22-3, and three, not 21-3 and three with that midweek win over West Georgia. But let's get into it. So Embry-Riddle, they have a bit of an offense there. They're second in the conference in batting average and slugging at 301 and 445, respectively. And, well, they're led by that double play tandem of Camden Traficante at 393, who's the shortstop, and K- Chase Bruno, second baseman at 379. Uh, like I mentioned, they're both top 10 in the conference at hitting. 
Traficante is second in the conference in slugging percentage at 690, so he can provide some pop there as well. Dylan LaFreury is another name to watch. He's in possession of a 10-game hit streak. He's up to 300 on the year. And that bullpen, so one particular name you want to look out for is Max Meyer. He has a 2-1-4 ERA across 21 innings with three saves. As he looks to make a appearance or two out of the bullpen to shut the door. So St. Leo, that 22-3 and three team, like I mentioned, they're eighth in the country. There's a lot of talk about on the mound, as they should. They currently sit third in the country with a 3-3-5 team ERA and sixth in the country with a 1.25 whip. And that all starts with Luke Lashutka, 6-0, 1-6-1 ERA, lands him second in the conference in both of those categories. And talk about a strikeout-to-walk ratio. Lashutka has struck out 41 batters and walked just five, over 50 in a third inning so far this season. Offensively, the Lions are a bit of a patient team. They like to work their walks. They're 18th in the country and on base percentage at 439. And, well, they were... Happy to welcome back Mikey Scott, who missed a couple weeks. He's currently at 400 on the season. He hit two home runs with seven RBI. He'll be a player to look out for this weekend. Dylan Mass has four multi-hit games in his last five games. He leads the team in hitting amongst qualified hitters at 360. Callan Moss has hit safely in 12 of his last 13 games. And Buck Anderson has a 10-game history. So a lot going well for this St. Leo offense is they're starting to pick up a little bit with the batting average, but keeping up with that on-base percentage. And so this will be a final, for me, a final and fun series to watch. Yes, and the final and fun series to watch for me is we'll head out to the RMAC, Colorado State Pueblo at Colorado School of the Mines. Uh, Pueblo 5-3 and three in RMAC play, Mines 4-4. Four and four. And when we look at this series, Friday, Saturday, Sunday matchups on the RMAC Network is how you can watch it. CSU Pueblo, when we look at them, they split a series last weekend. Probably a disappointment for them at New Mexico Highlands. And so how do they respond? And they gear up for a road RMAC series once again at Mines. And it's a Mines team who played close, really was right there against Mesa, but fell short in each of the four games last week. And after sweeping their first weekend, Mines got swept last weekend and, again, played very closely against a team at Mesa, a very tough place to play, especially in RMAC play, basically an unbeatable team, it feels like, over the last few years at home within conference play. And when we look at this Pueblo team, they've turned our heads this year. They're third in the RMAC. Mines are fifth. So it's a battle for these teams to try to say, hey, who can make up some ground right now within these standings? And when we look at Pueblo, they're a team hitting 339 on the year, but the Mines they've thrown the ball well. And that's why this is a series to watch for me, not just what these teams did, the split and then getting swept, that's big. Where they are in the standings, that's big. But Pueblo, the best offense in the league, when you look at their batting average, going up against the best arms in the league, at least from an ERA perspective. Pretty wild, though, that they lead the league with an ERA of 6-2-6. Kind of shows you that the league is geared a little bit more, a lot a bit more towards offense, but they do lead the league in ERA at 626. Christian Castaneda is a name we'll continue to talk about until he um, makes us not talk about him, but he's one of the best hitters in the nation right now, hitting 432, OPS north of 1,500, just ridiculous with 11 bombs, 11 doubles. And then on the other side for the Mines, they've got some hitters, man. Obviously, with the way Jackson Woolwine's pit uh, hit the ball this year, he's been fun to watch. Mason Andrews has been hitting the ball well. They both have an OPS above 1,200 on the year, and both of those guys are certainly players to watch. So big RMAC matchup. Really kind of just curious to see, will this Pueblo offense kind of break out like we saw earlier in the year? Or, or will they struggle? Like, perhaps we saw, I mean, they put some runs up last week, but getting a split, probably not what you would have expected with how they started. So we'll see. We'll see what they can do against the Mines, who right now that ERA at least is uh, sitting pretty for our max standards. So that's going to be a fun one to watch. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're excited for it. We're excited to see how a guy like Christian Castaneda can 
continue his hot start, especially facing one of the best pitching staffs in the RMAC, again, according to ERA. So we're excited for it. I'm excited for it. But we're also excited for it in terms of other series to watch. And two that we're going to mention, again, we're releasing this Friday morning. So we want to mention some series that have already taken place, but we're not going to highlight them here because they've already taken place. So that's one is Goldie Beacom Jefferson. That series started Wednesday. We've recorded this after that game went final. So Jefferson is leading that series 1-0. Then we got action between two top 20 teams, UNC Pembroke and Mount Olive. They're playing a very interesting three-game series. They're playing a doubleheader on Thursday and then a single game Sunday. So two days off in between the third game is very interesting to see. But again, weather throughout the country is just affecting a lot of games this weekend. Like we mentioned with that North Greenville-Barton series, we mentioned with the Cal State San Marcos and Monterey Bay series, they're moving to doubleheaders. A lot of weather going on to try to beat the weather. A lot of NSIC action as well. They're playing a lot of teams today, and one we'd like to highlight is U Mary and Wayne State College. U Mary is currently tops in the nation at 2.36 home runs per game prior to the series. That's the number one team and number four team in the NSIC. Wayne State College being the number one team, U Mary being number four. But those are some some series that have already started that we'd like to highlight. Plus, what about you, Will? What are some series that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, absolutely. I think Northwestern Oklahoma at Harding has some intrigue in the GAC. A GLIAC action in Grand Valley and Saginaw. Saginaw team, man, I just you got to have your eyes on them with with McLaren and also Yachek. I mean, they they have a punch in Cornwell tearing the cover off the ball. This Saginaw team's very interesting. Crookston and Concordia St. Paul, man. I mean, Concordia St. Paul, how do they continue? A couple NSI teams you want to kind of look at. Emmanuel, a team that at times this year's looked really good at Belmont Abbey, who's won a lot of Conference Carolina games. Montevideo at Huntsville, that's going to be fun. To begin ECC play, how about do you feel at Malloy? A Malloy team that dropped out of our rankings. That's going to be also fun to see. A Friday doubleheader that you have to look at at least for any 10 standards, is SNHU at Southern Con State. You know, you want to see how this SNHU team can continue to play and get back to their normal selves. And then Mississippi College at Shorter, Coker at Ohio, Dominican in non-conference action, and then Lake Erie at Ashland. Can Ashland keep being hot? That's that's always something to look at against a Lake Erie team that's played a pretty decent over the last few weeks. So those are some to watch. Obviously, another GLIAC once Wayne State and Purdue Northwest. Uh, can uh, Kylander nearly get another perfect game if he throws in that series or in that game? We'll see because obviously it's 2-2 two and two in the GLIAC. But, yeah, those are some of the ones that I'd like to highlight, Robert. Oh, yeah, and we're excited for it. We can't wait to continue covering it this weekend. You know, like, like I mentioned earlier on, on the broadcast, we are all about Division Two baseball. We are going to continue to provide you coverage of Division Two baseball. We do not care of other sports that are going on, or maybe a little bit, but Division Two baseball is going to be our primary coverage, and we can't wait to continue to cover it for you. So thank you so much for watching, and we hope you enjoy these series to watch. So like and subscribe to all of our channels. We have a link tree that will be in the description below to allow you to follow all of our channels. Subscribe to our magazine, d2insider.com slash subscribe as well. That allows us to get, get, some, get some opportunities there to see all of our content as well. So please, thank you so much, and thank you so much for watching, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.